Welcome back to Brain Pods. Thank you for joining us. I am so excited to have a couple of guests with me today. Dr. Asadi, who you've met before. Hello again. Uh, who gave the HHD5 talk on neuromuscular. We're dividing that into uh, this massive sprawling topic into two brain pods. We're going to do the uh, peripheral nervous system uh, down uh, into the peripheral nerve and stop before we get to the neuromuscular junction today. And uh, Dr. Nathan Sitt from Hennepin County Medical Center. Hi. Uh, uh, Dr. Sitt is a uh, neuromuscular specialist. Tell us, tell us a little bit about what you do at Hennepin, Dr. Sitt. Yeah, so yeah, my name is uh, Dr. Nathan Sitt. Uh, I just graduated from University of Minnesota Neurology Residency here, and then I did my neuromuscular fellowship also at University of Minnesota. I've been working at HCMC as a neurologist and neuromuscular specialist since July. And so students year. will meet oh, you. Year. When will students will meet you in the clinic in, yep. on the inpatient service? Yes. yes? No, so I, I've got to meet lots of students in yep. the clinic setting uh, throughout the week. Sometimes students meet me to do a test called EMG with some patients. It's been great. Okay. Excellent. Good. And you will notice uh, the usurper uh, Joffrey Baratheon is over our shoulder uh, today. Um, all right. Let's just go ahead and roll right into it. Um, Dr. Asadi, we'll let you go ahead and take the lead here. All right, so hello again to all out there. So, all right, quickly going over, uh, as always, goals for this lecture. So here we're gonna talk about the peripheral nervous system, its anatomy, its physiology, and then ultimately its pathology. Uh, the goal here is to outline uh, at least a way that I think is useful to uh, categorize the large number of disease processes processes of the peripheral nervous system, and then we'll introduce what I would hopefully consider a reasonable number of illustrative <laughs> disorders. It's giant, if you're not getting that, uh, yep. that, uh, that sense from me, and, and ultimately help you develop a foundation for both understanding the PMS on your shelf in USMLE exams, but also in real life. Uh, because ultimately you will see patients with these with these disorders when you're on service with us. I was um, I was just thinking about I was I was talking to a medical student who is just finishing up just graduating fourth year and we were talking about I was telling her about brain pods and how we we're excited about the curriculum changes, and she told me that one of the one of the rather intimidating aspects of, of neurology was the volume of material, and that she thought the shelf of neurology was clearly right up there along with medicine in terms of just the amount of, of material. I mean, what Dr. Sit does with uh, EMG is so different than what I do in sleep medicine. They're, they're almost two different fields, but we got to try to, we got to try to uh, transfer that knowledge to you. And that's what we're going to try to do in terms of peripheral neurology today. All right, just a brief slide to give you the outline for today. So intro, a little bit of pathology, and then the neuropathies themselves. So, Again, what is the PNS, the peripheral nervous system? It's a huge topic. Uh, there's over 200 clear disorders. The actual truth is if you sort of blow that up, including all the genetics and, and, and everything. <laughs> thousands. It's, yeah, literally thousands. Um, overall, I would consider the PNS elegant. It's complicated, but it's also pretty simple, I think, when you sort of compare it to some of the processes, or some of the, what's happening in the central nervous system. So, the simple part is that anatomically, you basically have four parts. You have your neurons. Which are right here. Yeah, be they motor or sensory. You so have the... Just, to, just quick, that, just a reminder, so the sensory comes in through the dorsal root here, and the motor goes out through the ventral root here. Perfect. Uh, then there's the peripheral nerves themselves, which consist of the roots, uh, the plexus, the two different levels in the spine, and then the actual nerve bundles. And then there's the neuromuscular junction, and then there's the muscles. Which we'll get, which we'll get into those in uh, in uh, brain, the, our next brain pod. So, essentially, if you have four different parts, then you really have four different possible pathological areas, or po four potential areas of for pathology. Uh, what that means is that ultimately the pathology will follow from the anatomy, and that the way that I've sort of been taught to think about this and do think about this both in real life and on a test question is. Essentially, if you're dealing with something in the peripheral nervous system, you're probably only dealing with something in the peripheral nervous system versus things like strokes or seizures, which are really central nervous system problems. Oh, okay. There's relatively few things that actually affect both. Um, I don't know if Dr. Sid has a comment on that, but it's uh, thankfully just how it is. So for the nerves themselves, there's only four possible responses to any potential insult. There's a neuronopathy, which would be the cell body of the motor or sensory uh, nerve. You could have overall segmental demyelination of the nerve itself. 
degeneration of the axon or interruption of the axon with Wallerian degeneration? Just four. Yeah. That's uh, reasonable. I can manage that. Yeah. So when you move to the neuromuscular junction, there's really only two parts, right? There's the pre and the postsynaptic. So even more simple, right? When you're when you're sort of searching for where the pathology might be. Yep. The muscles are a little bit more complicated. It's diffuse. You have muscles everywhere, right? But that's for the next lecture. And I just understand it. We're doing neuromuscular junction of muscles later. So yep. we're only focusing on nerves right now, right? Yep. Exactly. So here's just a, a brief reference slide for what we're going to talk about going forward. But essentially, with your neuropathies, so you could have a neuronopathy, demyelinating, axonal, and then some sort of special focal or compression pathologies that you just have to know and constantly come up. And I'll just I'll just point out that if any of this is resonating a little familiar and is familiar with you, this is by design. So we are we are taking the baseline knowledge that Dr. Asadi provided during your HHD five talk those synapses that you started to create and then probably pruned off um, after you finished step one. Uh, and then we're, we're, we're hitting them again on purpose to try to grow those, those connections uh, in, your, in your brain uh, and then add in management, um, some patient videos so that you get used to kind of looking at these patients, uh, uh, some anecdotes, and then management. All right, so jumping right into neuronopathies. So you can get them one of two ways. Either you can acquire them throughout life for some reason or another, or you're born with them. We're essentially talking about, uh, for, for the next couple of slides, the ventral part of your spinal cord, where the motor neurons are. So that's the structure that the, will be the sort of base, or that's where the pathology is based. Uh, ultimately, if you have a pathology, you can then lose the motor neuron. And the result, uh, typically, would be a lower motor neuron sign. So this is something I know you've had probably a couple of times, but there are are, are signs and symptoms that sort of delineate <coughs> upper versus lower motor neuron lesions. And if you have a motor neuron loss, you should be talking about, or you should be talking about and thinking about lower motor neuron signs. This is, this is step one money right here, right? This, would, yeah. would you ever, Dr. Dr. Sit? It's not, will this be tested in the step one, it's how many times. Right. This is, this is pretty big. And one of the ways that I was taught to remember where the motor neuron cells are, so fortunately for, us, we're trying to learn all this neuroanatomy. Motor is always in the front and sensory is always in the back. So if you're looking at the spinal cord, the anterior yep. horn cells are yep. in the front, whereas the sensory, the dorsal columns are in the back. The same goes with the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus in the brain in yep. terms of motor and, and sensory. And even with speech, uh, I'm, oh, now I'm, now I'm getting outside. No, no, let's go. Language. language. Even, yeah. with language. Go, even with language. Go ahead. Even with language, the right. area is in the front, uh, in the frontal parietal area, whereas Wernicke's area, this, uh, the comprehension and sensation of uh, understanding speech is in the back, Wernicke's area. So I'm sorry I delved outside. No, that's good. No, that's good. Bit, that's good. Let's, but it helps me remember where the interior horn cells I'm are. I'm going to keep us off track just for a second to take this. <laughs> and then if, the, what it, what the occipital lobe is clearly receptive, afferent, visual input. Exactly. And executive function is, what is, what is executive function besides helping you manifest behavior motor activity, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. So, all right. Final word just on this slide before we move forward. We're going to talk about motor units, and this is just to sort of outline what that is. It's the nerve plus the muscle it innervates. So whenever we, if you hear motor unit, we're talking about that entire structure. All right. All right, so first neuronopathy we'll talk about, one you've almost certainly heard of before, which is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. This is an acquired one. You develop it, typically speaking, later in life. It consists of two parts. So there's the amyotrophy part. So this is muscular atrophy, which is essentially secondary to <coughs> loss of the innervation from those motor neuron cells in the anterior part of the spinal cord, and uh, cranial nerve motor nuclei. Okay. So ultimately, you get atrophy of the spinal mo of the spinal roots uh, and the cranial nerve roots. You get a flaccid weakness. That's typically actually the first sign you might see or the first thing that the patient might come in complaining about. Loss of muscle mass, fasciculations, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then uh, in late stages, you might see loss of reflexes, although you typically when the patient comes in, they'd actually see very increased reflexes. The lateral sclerosis part, essentially you're talking about the degeneration of the corticospinal, the lateral columns, uh, and the cortical ball of all tracts. Uh, which essentially loss of motor neurons in the primary motor cortex. This gives you essentially some upper motor neuron signs. So this is sort of the, even though we're using this as the 
the, the, the stereotyped uh, disease here is actually a little bit of both upper and lower motor neurons. And so here we'd be talking about a little bit of spastic weakness and hyperreflexia, sort of traditional upper motor neuron signs. Just, just to underscore that, that's how the test question would be written, right? It's right. E individual, usually old, middle age or at the youngest or older, weak, um, and they got both fasciculations and atrophy suggestive of uh, lower motor neuron and also their spastic. Mm -hmm. They got some un other, other reflexes are increased, yeah. right? Yeah, so in a way we're starting with the exception because both are affected. So if a person presents yeah. with upper and lower signs, they either have two conditions, which is unfortunately less common, right. or they may have ALS. All right. Uh, so just hammering home the point, it's upper and lower motor neuron. So <coughs> clinically and in a vignette, sort of also underscore what Dr. Howell is saying, you should have a progressive painless, which does not involve the sensory uh, neurons, uh, painless weakness and atrophy, typically in a distal limb. So like maybe their, one of their hands or legs will start and then it spreads. You can also have, uh, sometimes, and this is a little bit more common in women, vulvar onset, so you're talking about sort of speech difficulties, swallowing difficulties, that might be the first thing that, that shows up. That actually has a worse uh, outcome, quicker. Um, about 10% of people actually show a, a dementia. And what, what kind of dementia? Well, I'll d defer that to Dr. Sitt. Oh, very well. So, uh, typically the dementia seen with ALS, fortunately most patients with ALS don't have dementia, but a substantial, uh, let's say about 10% of patients do, and it's a frontotemporal dementia where the problem isn't memory. Alzheimer's dementia is more of a memory problem, whereas frontotemporal dementia is more of a problem with uh, behavior and with speech. So, uh, these patients uh, may have difficulty uh, with uh, making decisions, they may make inappropriate decisions. It's something that makes mm -hmm. uh, management a little bit more difficult, um, but uh, it's something to be aware of anytime you meet somebody who may have ALS. Just as a little aside here, um, w w describe your experiences, anecdotally is fine, with the personalities of people with ALS. So anecdotally, most of the people I meet with ALS are just like anybody else that you would you would meet. Um, they're would, would you say? But I, I'm getting at specifically the what it may be apocryphal, it may be an urban legend, but how how insanely kind and sweet they are. Just just I mean, there's a there's yeah. a few exceptions to that. I, I, but I remember when I first got into ALS, yeah. like it almost seemed like this was a disorder that yeah. mainly struck people who you know we talk about personality disorders, but yeah. there's the flip side too. There are some people who are just altruistic and empathetic yeah. and yeah. just wonderful sweet people yeah. and for whatever reason it seems like they really tended to get this disorder more than other people you know um yeah I, like you say i don't have like data to support this but i have noticed that too um every neurologist i know hates als because unfortunately we don't know what causes it it's uh, a terminal illness uh, where a person unfortunately dies usually within the first one to five years from symptom onset and whoever f cracks the the cure for ALS yeah. for some patients with ALS deserves the Nobel Prize uh, ten times over. Yeah. So, All right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so frontal temporal dementia. Just to pull this together, uh, Dr. Starks is also going to put that same connection together when she talks about frontal temporal dementia and cognitive impairment. She'll mention the connection with um, ALS. All right. And the remainder of this slide is just to again sort of talk about uh, upper motor neuron signs, lower motor neuron signs, and then bulbar signs that you might be seeing both in real life and on a test question. Uh, overall, ALS typically uh, affects men more than women, sort of a two to one ratio. Uh, onset is typically in the 60s, but uh, my personal record is a 27 year old, unfortunately. Uh, so there are younger forms. It and, is and, Le and Lou Gehrig, who is it, was named after, developed this um, the New York Yankees. for the New York Yankees, a uh, baseball player for the New York Yankees, started to develop it late 20s, early 30s, and mm -hmm. you can actually see it in his, in his uh, baseball stats at the time. Mm -hmm. It is uh, ultimately currently uniformly fatal, uh, typically from pulmonary complications, because these people ultimately have infections and, and, and their breathing and everything just goes crazy. Uh, life expectancy is one to five years, as Dr. Sitt said, but it can be quite variable uh, depending on sort of the, the, the disease severity. Everybody mentions Stephen Hawking when we 
bring who, up ALS. Who tragically, just before we recorded this, just died. Um, was uh, helped inspire me on a life of science and fascination with the universe and mm -hmm. all things scientific. Mm -hmm. There is a subset of about 10% of people for whom this is genetic. Uh, two, two genes you should know are the superoxide dismutase. Uh, <coughs> definitely was on my step one and two, I believe. And the CR, uh, seven, C9 or excuse me, 72 which is a hexanucleotide repeat expansion. Uh, if you have the patient with the frontal, frontal temporal dementia, you might see uh, on pathology the TBP43 containing neuron. Which I think, the, and the, the letter to remember there is the T, right? Because that's tau. Yes. That, that tau is common in frontal temporal dementia and in this type. Mm -hmm. Now, I think one of the reasons why you probably got a step question about this is that is back not too long ago, SOD1 was almost the only gene we really thought of with uh, ALS. That is exploding now. Um, so we are up to close to 40 different genes uh, for <coughs> ALS. Uh, and it is, it's very likely that um, as these gene therapies start to come out, we'll show you an example of the, that in a minute, is that it, it's really going to completely depend upon what mm -hmm. genotype or what, what you have. And the discovery of a lot of these genes related to ALS in the last few years is a direct credit to the ALS Association and fundraising efforts by the Ice Bucket Challenge, which was yeah. has been viral for a couple of years now and raised millions of dollars for ALS-related research. Here's where we surprise Dr. Asadi and do the Ice Bucket Challenge right now. <laughs> <Here we go. laughs> surprise. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, uh, uh, next time. Next, next, next time on next Brain Pods. Next time. Uh, and also, you, you know, <laughs> ALS also is, um, is, has an incredibly robust uh, clinical consortium. Uh, and that, is, that, is, that is so that when, when, when people come along and say, hey, I think this agent might possibly work, they actually can fire it pretty quickly into a clinical trial to find out if that's true. And we'll just, I have a list coming up of all of the different agents that are coming, uh, that, are, that are currently being studied for ALS. Moving on to, so we have now an idea of what it is. Uh, how do we diagnose it? So it is still technically a clinical diagnosis. So you should see upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs in three regions. So that would be your arms, your legs, and potentially the bulbar. Um, having said that, there is also EMG criteria, El Escorial, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Spain. Uh, yeah. <laughs> following right? following yeah. a, yeah, yeah, so get together in Spain. Um, and in real life, you'll also see us do much more than just uh, sort of a, a once-over as far as the exam or an EMG is concerned. These people get gigantic workups to make sure that we're not missing something because this yeah. this ultimately is a death sentence when you're when yeah. you're giving this patient this diagnosis. Sure, yeah, terminal illness, yeah. um, treatment uh, is growing. Can recently. I can I just yeah. um, so a couple thoughts on diagnosis? If you have somebody who you're thinking of of um, ALS, you definitely want to image their neck. Yeah, uh, you, you sometimes it doesn't happen very often, but sometimes just a cervical myopath, a cervical my, cervical lesion can cause because it's it's in the neck. It'll cause lower motor neuron findings in the upper extremities, and then upper motor neuron lesion findings in the lower extremities, yeah. and yeah. and that's reversible, right? If there's if it, it mm -hmm. it's often reversible. Yeah, um, I mean, what if that somebody uh, was misdiagnosed with ALS, but then you image their neck and it turns out that it's a herniated disc pushing against the spinal cord right affecting those lower motor neurons in the arms where the disc is pushing but then also causing upper motor neuron signs in the legs yep. so you wouldn't want to miss that of course right. um, so on to treatment so the the one drug that we currently use although it's it's growing doctors they can probably speak about that um, is uh, really Zoll. this has a I guess eight to nine months is what I've seen, but it's also, I think, three months is essentially yeah. all you're getting out of this in terms of It's a very lifespan. humble treatment. It's been available for some years now. Um, uh, we offer it to every patient who we diagnose with ALS with the caveat that it may, the data only shows that it may extend life for, on average, maybe three months. Yeah. Although it's different for everybody. It's probably more like 10% of whatever person has left. So if you're catching someone in the very beginning, it may give them more in three months, maybe closer to eight or nine, it's possible. But if you're catching somebody um, in the late advanced phases of ALS, unfortunately it may not be three months, maybe less. Uh, I, I, 
Dr. Sit, my way of thinking about this is, is that it's a glutamate antagonist. Part of the apoptosis cascade is glutamate toxicity. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, maybe it's not just apoptosis, but uh, by right. blocking glutamate, you block some of the toxicity to the neuron. Is that is that is that the way we yeah. still think about that? And it's it's obviously not the whole picture of what causes ALS. Otherwise, right. this would be this treatment would be enough. But as our students probably learned in I think first year. Glutamate is more of a, a, an activating neurotransmitter. Exc excitatory. Excitatory, yep. in fact. Yep. Whereas GABA is the opposite of inhibitory. So if you reduce some of that glutamate toxicity, the idea is that it slows the progression of ALS. Got by it. a modest amount. Other than that, so besides the, the medication that sort of works, we, it's all supportive treatment. So these people typically will end up on a gastrostomy so they can actually get their food intake or their nutrition intake. Um, they'll end up on some sort of ventilation because they're going to have breathing problems and then uh, sort of what we call adaptive equipment to help them with, with speech difficulties. I put this picture in there uh, just th when, we, when we talk about neuromuscular medicine, we're talking about the diagnosis is almost always an EMG nerve conduction study. Studies, plural, I should say. There, these, are two different, yeah. these, are, these are two different studies. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Yeah. Sit, just how do you explain what these are to patients? So EMG is the best test we possess if we want to know whether nerves are working or not. It comes in two halves. The first half, we use small electric shocks to evaluate how well a nerve conducts uh, on some part of the body. That's the, so nerve, that's the nerve conduction study, That's the right? nerve conduction study. So we'll stimulate at one part of the nerve, and we'll measure the response from the second part of the nerve, and we'll see what it looks like. Or vice versa, or going the other way. Exactly. Right? Yep. Yeah. So it's it's uh, so that's the first half. The second half, no uh, no longer involving electric shocks, we use a small needle, which is an electrode sensing electrical activity in the muscle, and that gives us additional information on whether there is evidence of nerve damage or any other peripheral nervous system problem. So that's so. and that's the EMG. Yeah. And maybe in 50 years, they will look back at this test and say, though, that was kind of barbaric that we were doing this kind of uncomfortable test. It's totally safe, but um, it, it's the best test we have if you want to know if nerves are working or not. Yep. All right. Um, so here's just a list. Um, there are, the last couple of years have been very exciting in <coughs> the neuromuscular therapeutics. Uh, with one very dramatic example uh, coming up in a minute. Uh, but um, this is just a partial list of the various drugs that are being involved in rigorous placebo-controlled um, uh, treatment trials. Um, who, most of these are not going to work. Uh, some of them hopefully will. Um, and I, even, I think uh, Dr. Sit, the ALS Center at uh, Hennepin, is involved yeah. in a couple of these, right? Yep, that's right. So um, a couple of these trials, like the Tiracemptive trial uh, HCMC is involved with, as well as the AMLEX, uh, that AMX0035 study, we'll, we'll see what we see. As of the recording of this video, Adarivone was FDA approved. This about, one right here. Yep. It's a... Uh, Similar to Rilizol, it's another humble medicine that slows progression, but we don't possess any medicine that can reverse ALS yet. Yet. All right. Uh, let me just talk, um, one of the, as, as we talked about in the sleep brain pods, uh, when, what happens normally during REM sleep is we, uh, we become, we lose our skeletal muscles, and so... Uh, we lose accessory muscles of respiration. We lose our uh, intercostals. We lose our sternocleidomastoids. mastoids. We still have an intact diaphragm. But for most of us, that's perfectly fine because our diaphragm is capable of ventilating for us when we're sleeping. Uh, however, in the setting of ALS, that diaphragm may be weak. Um, and so people with ALS have often have horrible sleep. Uh, they retain carbon dioxide. Sometimes the retention of carbon dioxide be can become encephalopathic. Uh, they have increased work of breathing while they're sleeping, so they're not getting at it. Their muscles aren't resting at all; they're actually laboring, uh, and so when they wake up, they're more they're more tired and exhausted uh, than when they started. And so, if you if you treat these individuals with bilevel positive airway pressure, um, this will help. This helps ventilate them, and it gives their muscles a rest. Uh, it improves gas exchange, so they have more oxygenation. They have less hypercarbia. Uh, decreased work of breathing, 
uh, and it promotes sleep continuity. And this is one of the interventions that has been shown to prolong survival uh, and improves quality of life. So people just feel better and more alert during the day and it's really important to just aggressively get, get them on a bi-level positive airway pressure therapy. Um, here's just a slide just to remind us what the lateral sclerosis part of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is, which is, this is these are um, sections um, of the uh, spinal cord. Normally, you the uh, myelin here is dark, as you can see in the posterior columns, which are normal. But look here in the cortical spinal, lateral cortical spinal tract, you see this pallor uh, here, 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 and here. That is the lateral sclerosis of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. All right. So uh, next up, we talk about poliomyositis. Not po polio. Po uh, what's, what's the name? Poliomyelitis. Hmm. All right, so little error on the slide there. It's not myositis. It's poliomyelitis. How is it again? Yeah, poliomyelitis. So myelitis, like a, myel like a myelopathy, spinal cord problem. So poliomyelitis. An inflammation in the, in the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. Yep. As opposed to myositis, which is an inflammation in the muscle, which we will get into in brain, the next brain box. Stay tuned. Yes. <laughs> so this is another acquired neuronopathy. Okay, it's paralysis essentially caused by the polio virus, but uh, actually the poliomyelitis, it can be shorthand for any virus that does this. It's, uh, when we're speaking about polio, it's transmitted fecal orally. You get, again, an, an asymmetric paralysis and lower motor neuron signs. So here we're not talking about this mixed ALS, you know, upper lower motor neuron. Here it should be strictly lower motor neuron. Sort of have your peak of this paralysis about 48 hours. Again, because we're talking about the motor neurons, you should not see any sensory complaints. Uh, this one can be quite devastating to people, so two-thirds are going to be left with some sort of deficit, uh, be that a very light deficit or really life-altering one, uh, including and up to like straight atrophy of the limbs that were involved. It can largely be prevented because you have a vaccine for this. Uh, diagnosis, you essentially go looking for, uh, for abnormalities in the CSF. Treatment is essentially supportive. We don't have any outright cure for this. Yep. And uh, there is uh, something to know, because this is definitely also on your test, there's what's called a post-polio syndrome. I have never seen it in real life, but I've definitely answered questions about it. Oh, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. Have you seen it, Dr. Yeah. Sir? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Yeah. I have. Um, yeah. Just, a, just a couple comments about polio, because um, so it's an enterovirus, um, fecal or as you mentioned, fecal oral transmission. Other... Um, since, since polio in large part has been nearly wiped out, although not completely, other enteroviruses, um, what is it, echovirus, Coxsackie, they can rarely, rarely, rarely cause this. Uh, you'll get into West Nile in a moment. Um, the, what's this, Salk and Sabin vaccine just yeah. really revolutionized. Think of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. A lot of people... This was, a, this was probably the most common cause of uh, childhood paralysis yeah. uh, back before the vaccines. It's a wonderful public health success story. Um, I, in 1999, I saw one of the final cases of a vaccine-induced polio because at that time it was still an oral vaccine, mm -hmm. which very, very rarely, very, very rarely would cause a polio syndrome. Mm -hmm. In a young, I think she was about a seven, eight year old girl. Mm -hmm. So, was, and that was a tragic story. They were just moving, they were just getting rid of the oral vaccine at that point and moving to the inactivated vaccine at that point. Um, Post polio syndrome is someone who has had polio, recovered for the most part, and then help me understand help me yeah. understand this doctor said so later yeah. when they're older and they have less reserve yeah. they the, the symptoms come back again so um, I I only know a little bit about post polio syndrome to tell you the truth but what I do know is that um, you know as, as people get older um, they tend to get a little bit weaker over time you know a person can't do the things that they did at age 21 that yeah. they do at age 65 and probably what's happening is that some people who suffered a polio infection, they probably lost some of their anterior horn cells from the infection itself. 
and then later in life, as a person is uh, slowly aging, it you just notice a little bit more of the progressive weakness in those patients than um, than the general population. And but, it, it's usually focal, right? I mean, it's, sometimes it's it's quadriplegia, but more often it's it's mono, it's a weakness of one arm, and it's like, yeah, you know, my right arm is weak, and that's the same thing that was weak for six months when I was eight years old. Yeah, and that, that would make sense. Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, t tell us about West Nile, Dr. Sadi. So West Nile, so it's like we were saying, polio or polio-like syndrome can be caused by anything. So West Nile is a big one to know about. It clinically looks basically exactly the same, and I would say it's much more likely at this point, especially in the United States, yep. where we don't really have polio anymore. Yep. Uh, it's fairly seasonal, so this is always something to put in your head when you're seeing a patient in the late summer into the early fall. Uh, another sort of clue is that these patients will typically have fever to go along with their, with their weakness, as well as some confusion and even seizures. That's a big one. This one we can go directly after in the CSF, so there's an IgM you would test for, uh, for West Nile. And again, treatment is supportive in these cases. All right. uh, moving on with the neuronopathies, there's Kennedy's disease. So this is a congenital form. I, I, we got to say it. We got us named after the Our famous Dr. Dr. William, Dr. Kennedy. Dr. William Kennedy here at, still at, uh, uh, at the university and yeah. uh, very robust clinician and researcher mm -hmm. for the last 50 years here at the University of Minnesota. Still publishing. St yep. Yeah. <laughs> Still here. He, he, ma he makes the rest of us. He puts the rest of us to shame. He kind of does, yeah. <laughs> so, so Kennedy's disease. So again, we're now we're talking about a congenital. This <coughs> is a form of spinal muscular atrophy. It's X-linked CAG uh, repeat disorder, which essentially leads to androgen insensitivity. It's lower motor neuron signs. It's proximal greater than distal muscle weakness. And the sort of key features are facial fasciculations, and then gynecomastia or testicular, testicular atrophy, so that's sort of the effects of the androgen insensitivity. It uh, can be confused with ALS, but the sort of giveaway uh, is, is that you should only see lower motor neuron signs, and especially if you're seeing the gynecomastia or testicular yep. atrophy, that's, a, that's sort of a clear giveaway that you're talking about Kennedy's disease. So what, what age does this, will this present in? Uh, it can it could present in uh, 20s or 30s. Okay. So it, it's so young, typically young a little adulthood. younger than a, a, a average patient who has ALS. But older than the typical patient with spinal muscular atrophy. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And because this condition is X-linked recessive, um, only men get this condition. And then the sort of other key thing: these people have a normal life expectancy. Let's talk a little bit about spinal muscular atrophy. Um, this is. It's, it's considered a rare disorder, but if you're a pediatrician taking care of newborns, it, it's in the differential of a child who's born, uh, referred to as the floppy baby, so without, without adequate muscle tone. <clears throat> it is a degeneration of the anterior horn cells, so it results in lower motor neuron weakness only. Um, the uh, child is born, they're weak, they're not moving. Uh, there's often decreased fetal movements uh, in utero. Uh, they have difficulty feeding, often respiratory failure. Uh, it's loss of function in uh, the sp uh, spinal motor neuron gene, which fortunately is a relative in the terms of in in terms of genetic complexity. It's a fairly simple loss of function mechanism, um, and there's different types. There's spinal uh, muscular atrophy type one, which presents a childhood and is nearly universally fatal. Spinal muscular atrophy type two and three tends to present when, when individuals are a little older. This is this is just a devastating condition for parents, and and children. This is this is an example of what spinal muscular atrophy looks like. No, very very little motor tone. Otherwise, these these children are perfect. Their their nervous system, afferent nervous system, brain, um, uh, intellectual capability, all perfectly normal. Um, Here's what uh, a child with spinal muscular atrophy often looks like at their first birthday. Um, so when they're a little bit older, uh, need peg tube feeding, need often respiratory support, tracheostomy. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I was, I was hinting at, um, mm -hmm. you know, some just mind-blowing success in, yeah. in therapy for um, uh, neuromuscular disease. I found out about this. So I'm a I'm a mainly a sleep person. I find out about 
<clears throat> neuromuscular therapies just at pr pretty much as a consumer reading the New York Times or just walking around through the American Academy of Neurology. This is a truly miraculous, groundbreaking yeah. therapy. Um, it is a we're witnessing history. Yeah, we're witnessing history. So this is a this is this is what it is. This is nusinersen. This is a antisense oligonucleotide. Is that is that R is that considered RNA interference? I can't remember. <laughs> But it it ultimately re it's it it results in increasing the sp the normal uh, spinal motor neuron protein. Okay, so this is just and here is here is um, three videos. If you want to be inspired, go to YouTube and, and look up Nusa and Ersen, uh videos. So here is this is a story that is available online. It is um, this is a child whose older sibling died at a very young age of respiratory failure. Um, I think even before the child hit a few months of age, uh, and this is a this is a little girl who was born uh, was uh, recognized to have uh, the gene spinal and have the clinical syndrome, uh, and started getting this antisense oligonucleotide. I have a few videos just to show you what happens. So this is right at the very beginning. <laughs> Quite a bit of weakness, uh, head lag, which is not unusual for a newborn, but quite a bit of uh, weakness already, though starting to develop a little, quite a bit more motor strength than, uh, a chi than a typical SMA child without getting this therapy. Here is after dose four. Mm -hmm. So perfectly normal motor development uh, at that age, uh, smiling, head control, uh, uh, limb movement. Here we are at dose six now. Maybe you get some new books for Christmas? Dragon Smell Tacos! Yay! I mean, I mean, I just, that is, that is just so inspiring. Um, it is it's 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 really i mean i've i've been hearing about genetic therapy for disease since i was in college 25 years ago i didn't know if i would ever live to see it start happening and sma type 1 the worst kind and this is a condition where uh, unfortunately before this treatment uh, a baby would die within 1 year yep. they would die within 1 year and now not only is there a treatment to help these babies live but actually get develop motor function, which yeah. is just incredible, and, and do really well, really, really well. All right, um, and this is this is just just to give you some perspective. So Peter Karachunsky, uh, I just ran into him the other day, and is and in his you know typically, you know Russian understated way. <laughs> yes, they're, the kids are doing well. <laughs> he's got like 40 he's, he's like yeah. has 40 patients on this already Good. right here Good. so really yeah. inspiring mm -hmm. stuff all right next um, let's talk about let's talk let's move past uh, the anterior horn spell, uh, cell and uh, move into uh, demyelinating diseases all right yes yeah. so now we move down the uh, motor unit a little bit so with demyelinating again there's acquired and congenital essentially we're talking about injury and or destruction of the myelin sheath this is the Schwann cell in the PNS. It's a little bit different than the cell in the CNS. 
Uh, the overall result is that you'll get slowing or just straight up stopping of the axonal signals that are being propagated down the axon. Clinically, what you should be seeing is an early loss of reflexes, uh, sensory change, which we sort of compare to the neuron opties where we're not seeing that, uh, and mild atrophy that you would think is out of proportion to the amount of weakness that you might be seeing. Pathologically, you'd look at or should see ongoing demyelination and remyelination, which is this famous uh, onion bulbing that uh, has almost certainly appeared on your step one, step two, and, and pretty much every licensing test you ever take. <laughs> so the, the uh, sort of the most common one, the one that you'll definitely almost certainly see uh, when you're on service with us here is Guillain-Barre. We, we at least have one a month, I'm sure, at least. Between the it's ICU and Hennepin has them. I mean, it's, it's, this is, it's sometimes referred to as rare, but I guess when you're a neurologist at, you know, at a large hospital, these rare diseases aren't that rare. But. So this is uh, acquired. Uh, it's an acquired inflammatory polyradiculopathy. So you're talking about the, 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 uh, the earliest parts of the, of the nerves coming off the cord. Yep. Uh, it's essentially you'll see progressive weakness in the feet that then ascends, so that's your sort of classic clinical picture, uh, associated with numbness and tingling. Uh, the patient should be areflexic. That's always a, a pretty dead giveaway. I would say that's not true in every single case in real life, yep. but definitely every case on a test, that's, that's, that's true. You might get to see some autonomic dysfunction. The classical story is that it follows an infection, uh, click, cl uh, most typically uh, CGG9. And when you are looking to diagnosis, you're definitely going to tap them, and you'll see increased protein, but essentially no WBC. So you don't see sort of an ongoing infection that's causing this. So CSF stands for cerebral spinal fluid. We're talking about doing a, a spinal tap. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, when you do the uh, EMG and nerve conduction studies, you'll see demyelinating features. So this is sort of slowing of the signal or arrest of the signal. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Sit wants to add anything to this. And treatment is ultimately plasma exchange or IVIG. Um, Intravenous immunoglobulin. Right, just it's it's it just sucks up all it just binds up all the pathologically. Yeah. I mean, is that how it works? I mean, how does how does IVIG work? I like to think of it as it's trying to cl it clears out the the antibodies that a person is making against their own nerves in friendly fire, and it's getting rid of those. What about what about the antibodies I like? What about, you know? Those are okay. Those are okay? <laughs> All right, because I like some of them. To tell you the truth, we don't fully understand how IVG works, but I'm just keeping it yeah, like that, leaving it at that. Fair enough. Uh, just one thought on this slide. So um, I really uh, I really do hang my hat on the A reflexia for, for what it's worth. As somebody who doesn't see, you know, every atypical version of this, um, when you have, if, if I don't have reflexes, if, if I'm seeing somebody without with this clinical picture without reflexes, I just assume it's Guillain-Barre syndrome until proven otherwise. Yeah. Um, just uh, re-emphasize treatment. So it's in addition to those pathological antibodies, there's also an inflammatory complement cascade that would needs to get sucked up either with IVIG or cleaned out with plasma exchange. Uh, and then these people do extremely well, but they need our colleagues in rehab, the physical therapists, occupational therapists, and uh, speech language pathologists. This is, this is another one of those very serious conditions, can be life-threatening from the um, dysautonomia, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, but if you, respiratory failure, but if you can get them through, they do really well. So usually, usually the axon itself is spared, right? Yeah. And so it, all they need to do is just, you know, the wiring is still there, they just need to remyelinate exactly. themselves down. And so this is, an, this is a story of, um, I, I pulled this from YouTube, of a woman who experienced uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome postpartum. And it tells her story of a whole year uh, it took her to kind of get back to where uh, she wanted to be and how, how close she came to death with respiratory failure.
Is, uh, that is a wonderful story. Yeah. Yeah. These 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 are these are great. Uh, they're, they're you know if you can get them through you know the initial terrifying period they typically do really quite well. There is a variant. There's an axonal variant which is what ten percent of the cases is that um, yeah something like that something something like that and that and they actually tend not to do quite as well because the axon itself is damaged. Mm -hmm. uh, but. But really, with supportive care and uh, you know wonderful support, they can they can end up doing really well. Um, all right, next, uh, and then uh, so that's acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy, uh, also known as Guillain-Barré syndrome. You if it if it lasts longer than four to six weeks, as Dr. Asadi mentioned in his slide before, this is called chronic. Uh, otherwise, it looks very similar: diffuse weakness, sensory loss, they lose reflexes. Their cerebral spinal flow shows increased proteins with absent cells. Um, they tend not to get respiratory failure quite as much, lasts longer than six weeks, uh, and chronic recurring course. So you treat them, they get better, uh, and then it, and then it comes back again. Uh, any other thoughts, Doctor? Just, just for clarification for our students watching at home. So if anyone's wondering, well, why didn't the video of the woman we just saw have CIDP if she was recovering over the course of a year? Yep, yep. What they mean by last longer than six weeks, it means that unfortunately they continue to get weaker and weaker over the course right. of six to eight weeks. So if they hit the bottom within less than four weeks then start to recover, that's Guillain-Barre syndrome. Got it. Good point. Uh, moving on to non-inflammatory, so these would be inherited demyelinating neuropathies. Yeah. So here we have the congenital one, otherwise known as uh, one of them being Charcot-Marie II. There are several types. Um, <clears throat> the most common is the autosomal dominant one, although there are several others. Yeah. This is a defect in your myelin coating gene, so you just don't make the myelin as well to begin with. Here you'll see distal symmetric uh, weakness, a motor uh, greater than sensory, and you have a demyelinating polyneuropathy. There's a few like very common characteristics uh, that you should know about. One is that these people will have very high arched feet, also known as pest cavus. Uh, hammer toes. Pest cavus, got it, okay. Uh, yes. Hammer um, toes. Hammer toes, yes, <laughs> thank you. And um, absent ankle jerks when you're, when you're going after reflexes on examination. So next up, uh, sort of moving to the axons themselves as far as the neuropathies are concerned. So there's a sort of a subdivision here, because this is, I think, a giant topic that covers a lot of ground, um, and is not, I think, uniformly handled well when we're looking at review texts or textbooks. But you have acquired and hereditary. Under acquired, there's uh, metabolic, the big one to always sort of know about is diabetic neuropathy. There's also toxic causes, nutritional causes. So toxic, or is this like the, the heavy metals that we screen for? What are the yeah, it could be toxic to medications, it could be oh. alcohol, it could be medication. The big medications, maybe the chemotherapy agents. Yep. The, um, mm -hmm. yep. yep. Booze will do it? Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, af it's number two after diabetes is alcohol. Okay. Yep. Nutritional, I guess the first example is B12, the big one that we're always testing for. Um, and then immune inflammatory uh, could be a, uh, is one of the subdivided uh, acquired causes. Now, and don't forget, when, it, when we say B12, we also think of uh, what's referred to as subacute combined degeneration. So they get the dors they get the afferent axonopathy. They tend to get proprioceptive loss, and then they get they do get lateral cortical spinal weakness as well, right? So they, in in addition to an axonal neuropathy. Yep. Yep. Um, overall, axonal degeneration is the most common reaction reaction of the nerve to any any injury. And another thing that's sort of key about uh, this this subset of disorders is that the myelin will break down at the same time as the axon. 
so you can sort of contrast that with what we were just speaking about with GPS. For what it's worth, when you're in the uh, clinics, the neurology clinics, when one of your staff said this patient has neuropathy, this is generally what they mean. Yes, that's right. That's right. It's usually an axonal neuropathy. Yes. Again, typically these things are going to start distal, so more in your feet, and then move proximally, so they're going to ascend. Uh, if you have a length-dependent process, uh, you'll, I would say, you see that, again, more distally first. By the time it hits your knees, it's going to end up, you'll feel it in your fingertips. Um, it can affect uh, motor function in the lower extremities. You will see these uh, essentially more with systemic disorders. So everything we just talked about that's not sort of localized to the axon itself, sort of a reaction of a, of a diffuse process that might be happening. Uh, again, sort of with key features, sensory symptoms are usually going to be first. Fingers are going to be involved at the time the pathology reaches the knees as it's ascending. You shouldn't see ankle reflexes, uh, and you should see symmetry, because again, we're talking about a diffuse process that's uniformly attacking uh, the nervous system. This is, this is why endocrinologists spend, who take care of a lot of diabetics spend so much time looking at feet. It's a, it's a marker of, of, of poorly controlled diabetes. Well, let me put it this way. A marker of really well-controlled diabetes is that they still have X, their, their feet are fine. Mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. All right. So diabetic neuropathy, we'll just say a few words about that because it's so common, and I feel like this, you're, you're basically guaranteed to see it on any neurology rotation. So it's acquired. It's metabolic. It's up to 60% of diabetics, so they're going to have it. It's a distal axonal polyneuropathy. You're going to get pain, paresthesia, so the numbing, tingling, burning sensation. You'll see absent ankle jerks, uh, especially as the, as the disease process uh, progresses. It's certainly uh, true in just about any diabetic, but it's going to be more common if they're poorly controlled. It's going to happen faster. And the treatment really is to control the diabetes, so that might slow down the process, and then we have pregabalin or gabapentin for their pain control. Which are alpha-2 delta ligands. Right. Uh, moving on to the focal and compression type of neuropathy. So there's a few key ones, uh, again, that I think constantly come up every, every review book, every test you'll ever take. So Herb Duchenne is the big one. This is a plexopathy uh, in, your, in your brachial plexus. Up, yeah, so Herb is, Herb is the upper plexus. Mm -hmm. So it's injury essentially to the C5, C6 uh, roots. It's typically a baby with shoulder dystocia. So it's a very common story. The baby was larger. There was a sort of prolonged birth. They had to sort of pull the baby uh, out. You'll get lower motor neuron signs, going back to what we were speaking about at the very beginning. The patient will essentially... L lower motor neuron signs of the muscles innervated by C5, C6, right? Yes. Good. Actually, very yep. good point. Um, you'll see an adducted, internally rotated, and pronated arm. Right. So, yep. right. so, and they call it, what do they, they get, there's a name for it, right? The waiter's tip yeah. arm, right? Yeah, uh, and this it it's it occurs in birth. It can have it can occur, or these syndromes can happen either in trauma. You can yeah. get you can get vasculitis, which cause these unusual yeah. plexopathies. Yeah. So you you can see it mm -hmm. in in adults too. Yeah. Uh, treatment is typically supportive, uh, especially in, in in young babies. But sometimes sort of surgery is necessary to try to try to correct. Next up is clumpkies. So this is a, a lower brachial plexus plexopathy. Uh, here you're hitting your intrinsic hand muscles because you're hitting C8 and T1, which ultimately end in nerves controlling those muscles. Uh, again, sort of a traumatic birth, a shoulder dystocia is, is a very common scenario. So when you're sort of sorting these out on a, on a test or in real life, I mean, you think about what you're seeing clinically uh, because the, the original story could, I think, be very, very similar. And again, the idea is that treatment is supported. So I don't know if this is true, but how I remembered this was this can sometimes happen mechanistically with a falling injury where someone is falling, they're grabbing on mm -hmm. to, I don't know, a tree branch, mm -hmm. a wire as they're falling, and then they, they yeah. kind of their arm gets essentially pulled out. Yeah, so the bottom of the brachial plexus rather than the top of it. Right, yeah. right. Uh, here, is, here are um, three focal compressive neuropathies, very common. Um, you, will either, you will either experience these or someone in your life will experience them probably from time to time. So first one of those would be a median neuropathy, super common. It's an entrapment mononeuropathy of the median nerve. You've also, you've probably heard about it called carpal tunnel. 
Uh, it's chronic pain and numbness. Uh, it should be over your first three digits because that's what the median nerve is applying. You can also see plantar muscle atrophy as the disease progresses. So that's this this sort of this pad of muscles right underneath your thumb. What pad muscles? What? It's, we're on radio. Careful, that's we got here. <laughs> so these, the plantar right. pad. There we go. Right there. Right. Um, overall risk factors are hypothyroidism, diabetes, obesity, and just sometimes overuse or sort of poor positioning people who, who do certain types of, of jobs, uh, lots of typing mm -hmm. or desk yeah. work, things yep. like that. Um, you'll have a very strong suspicion clinically, but we have a, you can diagnose it on EMG, a nerve conduction study. Mm -hmm. And then treatments, uh, typically we like to start conservative splints, reducing the whatever the sort of inciting factor is, but sometimes in more advanced cases we do have to actually do surgery release. Mm -hmm. uh, next up is an ulnar neuropathy. Again, entrapment mononeuropathy. This is at the elbow. This is now going to hit your ulnar nerve. So we're talking about numbness, tingling in digits four and five. So you're going to hit those two. Ring finger, and pinky finger. Do you get hypothenoratrophy with this? Uh, you can. It's, so uh, here's the FDI muscle right here. First uh, dorsal gonna, interosci. Yep. And that's going to be one of the first to go. It's the one that helps to make the peace sign. So again, diagnosis, EMG, and again, treatment is supported versus surgery, where they'll actually take the nerve and sort of remove it from its, its natural resting place in the, in the, uh, as it travels through the elbow. And these, elbow. you know, the, the, the cases where, and there's, and we don't get, uh, do we do foot drop? The other, the, I don't know if we have a slide on foot drop here, but uh, perineal neuropathy, perineal compression, uh, this is not helping, I don't think, our viewers very much. But <laughs> um, I see these, I'll tell you the story where I hear these often after weight loss, right? So they, people, mm. people lose quite a bit of weight. They lose that adipose pad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then they, and then they start getting focal neuropathies. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then, uh, then, uh, uh, and then last one, last one in the upper extremity is uh, yeah. radial neuropathy. So just last major nerve that we all have to know about in the in the upper extremity, the radial nerve. So again, it's compression. You're talking about the spiral where, groove here. Show us where the spiral groove is. Right. Yes, Rami shows where this. <laughs> <laughs> right here. Right there. Right. It's what's well, here, right? It's like it's in the. Yeah. It's in the. Oh, it's yeah. on the humerus, right? So it's, it's a groove in yeah, the humerus, right? right? As it group as it rolls over, mm -hmm. and if you fall asleep on it, yeah. pass out on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For example. For example. Typically, the story here is going to be more of an acute onset of weakness. Uh, you're going to have. Uh, problems with wrist extension, finger extension. You might have heard it called the Saturday Night Palsy. So the, the story is that a um, person who's lost alcohol for one reason or the other passes out on a park bench or something like that. Or no reason whatsoever. Or no reason whatsoever. <laughs> um, and they're, they have sort of their, their arm is malpositioned and they wake up and they, they can't uh, extend their wrist or their fingers. What is the, Dr. Sit, what's the uh, carpal tunnel syndrome aside? Uh, what what are the what's the prognosis of these peripheral neuropathies? Usually? They're pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So um, these processes generally causes uh, injury to the myelin sheath at the site of entrapment. Yeah. And if the Schwann cells can simply remyelinate that area because you take away the problem, yeah. uh, it gets better. It gets better. And and a couple thoughts. Just one thought about the radial nerve because I think a lot of our students are listening to us throw around brachial plexus and they're they're itching. They're having allergic reactions, thinking about the brachial plexus <laughs> from first year. Okay, so if if you're looking at the radial nerve and someone says, "What innervates this extensor?" It could be finger extensor, it could be wrist extensor, it could be arm extensor. Just say, "I don't know." Radial. That's what the radial nerve does. Extension. So, Great, excellent. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Sit, Dr. Asadi. Thanks for having uh, me. We, uh, we rocked through uh, peripheral neurology down. Uh, we're almost to the, we're down to the neuromuscular junction, which is where we will start next time. Yep. Um, look forward to it. Uh, everybody have a great day.